Well, it is, uh, it is great to be here and uh, speaking uh, about something that, uh, that uh, I'm happy to say a friend of mine uh, helped develop. Uh, this is the Kahook Dual Blade. Um, you know, the, the concept here is that obviously the MIGS revolution is trying to access the collector channels inside of the Canal of Schlem to lower the pressure. Uh, this is a safe, uh, generally safe approach. Um, and there's some barriers though to different techniques of doing it. For example, with the trabectome, you have to buy a machine and then you have disposables. The i involves a very uh, expensive implant. Uh, the question here is can we use instrumentation, uh, a well-designed blade, to uh, excise, not incise, uh, the trabecular meshwork and open up the canal of Schlem. The design of the Kahook dual blade uh, involves two parallel blades. You'll see it is, this is an instrument, it's a disposable instrument uh, that, ha that are, has two blades so that when the tip of the blade is entered into the canal of Schlem, the, the two blades will excise a strip of trabecular meshwork including the outer wall of Schlem's canal. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it sort of looks similar to many of the other instrumentation that you might use in the angle uh, and it's going to be done with gonioscopic visualization. <clears throat> Just one comment on that, I think at this point if you're managing glaucoma that gonioscopic visualization uh, is a technique that you want to have uh, in your uh, tool bag because uh, many of the implants, uh, other techniques um, will depend on that skill. So here's a video I'm going to show. Uh, in the video, we've already got a view of the trabecular meshwork in the canal of Schlem through standard uh, intraoperative gonioscopy. There's viscoelastic in the anterior chamber on the corneal surface, and we're using a Swan Jacobs or a similar model uh, gonioscopic lens. So um, we're viewing the trabecular meshwork. Uh, we've got a, a deep anterior chamber. It's nice to have a case where there's good pigment on the trabecular meshwork so you can see your target and uh, we're going to introduce the blade here and we're going to start on one side of the angle, sweep across and then come from the other direction. Why, why would we need to do that? Well, we don't just want to open up the canal, we want to actually excise the strip of trabecular meshwork. So uh, we're moving along here and you can really see that the pigmented trabecular meshwork is gone. Uh, you, you, what you can't maybe see is that it's, it's dangling as a little strip here. Uh, you can't see it yet, you will in a moment. Uh, so, um, we moved along and then we're coming back from the other angle. How many degrees can we open up here? I, I think I was maybe getting 110, 120. I'm sure uh, you could come from, technically from a wound on the other side uh, to get, you know, both the nasal and temporal angle. Um, now, I'm seeing blood here is going to reflux from four collector channels. Icomed has spoken a lot about putting in several stents because he wants to access more than one collector channel. Uh, I see a blood signal from four collector channels here after the, uh, the dual blade procedure has been done. So I think that's a very good sign. Here's the strip of trabecular meshwork. This is, you know, the trophy you bring home and show to your uh, family. It's like catching a big bass. Um, but uh, it's nice to see that you've done something. And uh, you know, uh, now what, you know, I'll sometimes add endocyclophotocoagulation. I actually add them sometimes uh, to my Ahmed valves as well to try to get a dual mechanism and, and maybe to get a little bit of that work on uh, decreasing the pressure received, you know, to avoid the hypertensive phase. Um, after the procedure is done, it looks like a standard cataract surgery. Okay, so this is not, uh, you know, maximally invasive glaucoma surgery. To me, this really is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery with all the good visual acuity outcomes. Um, I think we're going to hear more about the data that we see, but suffice it to say that my cases have had excellent results. And, um, you know, again, I, I don't want to, um, this is some, you know, trimoxie being injected at the end of the cataract surgery. It's uh, something I do a lot with my MIGS cases because, uh, I find it helps with compliance post-operatively and I don't have pressure problems related to the trimoxy injection. So, um, what else do we have about the, uh, the dual blade? So, you know, you want to get a good view of the angle and uh, I think picking a case with dark pigment is always a good idea. Um, you got to remember there's some patients where you might not want to do angle surgery. Uh, you know, if you don't have a good view, um, elevated episcleral venous pressure, uh, inflammatory glaucomas. I say wet neovascular glaucoma here because I think if you, uh, if you had something that was a little more dry and, and a, you know, you could maybe consider it, although it's probably uh, technically for open angle glaucoma. 
And, and people who are poor candidate for outflow procedures, I think, are important to, uh, you know, to, to consider for this. Just looking at the angle anatomy, gonioscopy and intraoperative gonioscopy. Now, if, if you're here for the Ahmed valve part and you're just hearing about this now and aren't doing intraoperative gonioscopy, on your next five cataract surgeries, just take a look at the angle with a gonioscope at the end of the case. See what you can see. Um, that's the tough part of these surgeries. Once you have that skill down, uh, you know, actually getting the instruments in is a skill that, that you're all going to be very comfortable with. Um, all right, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, so the gonioscopy is the tough part. Um, again, usually done at the time of cataract surgery. And I always am thinking, how, how might this differ from something like the eye stent? Well, the eye stent has to be done at the time of cataract surgery. Opening up the angle can be done in phacic patients or in pseudophacic patients who aren't having anything done with cataract. So you have a little bit more of an indication. But of course, we often start with cataract patients because we're in the eye anyway. Uh, we put gonioscope, uh, gonio solution on the surface of the eye and get a view of the angle. We tilt the scope. We tilt the patient's head to maximize that view. Um, if you see folds, it's either because there's not enough viscoelastic in the anterior chamber or because you're pressing too hard with a gonio prism. Uh, so again, just more on t tilting the, uh, the microscope. Um, you know, you have the patient look away from you. Uh, I do this type of surgery both under a retrobulbar block or under topical. Um, if, if I'm doing it under topical, uh, I'll put some intracameral preservative free lidocaine in the eye. The patient's eye can move. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. They can move to help you get a better view, but you want to make sure they don't move when you're halfway through the surgery because that, that can present a little bit of a problem. You want nice high magnification uh, to see what you're doing. Um, we're generally going for the nasal angle here because we have a temporal incision. It's not impossible to do this from a superior incision. Um, and we're going to try to get as much of the angle as possible. We want the chamber to be deep. This is going to be more of a challenge if it's a, a phacic eye, getting the angle deep. In pseudophakes, after cataract surgery, after the intraocular lens is placed, you're just going to uh, touch up the anterior chamber with a little bit more viscoelastic, probably a cohesive viscoelastic, and then you'll be able to do the procedure. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it has to do with you know, the tilting you get and making sure you've got a good angle and visualization before you introduce the instrument. Um, You want to have the Kahook dual blade parallel to the iris uh, to get in. If you're coming uh, too far above, uh, you might really not be able to access the canal of Schlem uh, quite as well. So uh, you want to just come right across the iris. You don't want to burp your wound with the instrument as you go, so you want to pay some mind to what's happening with the instrument. And you want to remain wound neutral, so you're rotating the uh, instrument with the axis of rotation basically inside of the clear corneal incision. Um, then you're going to initiate the cut. So again, we're trying to go a little bit off center here because we want to get as much of the trabecular meshwork out as possible. Uh, and this aspect is very similar to probably initiating a trabectome surgery or initiating a um, uh, an eye stent placement or visco or trab 360, any of these things, you're going to apply a little pressure and, and gently pierce the, uh, the trabecular meshwork to get inside the canal of Schlem. Once you do this, you should be able to, with only just a little bit of pressure, um, move the hook dual blade along the canal and excise the trabecular meshwork. If the eye is moving when you move the instrument, you're probably a little too deep and maybe uh, engaging the posterior wall of Schlem's canal, which you don't want to do. So if that's the case, you just back up, apply a little less pressure, and move until you, uh, you have some, um, uh, some good movement and you can see you're making progress. Uh, you'll see the cleft, as we saw in the video, of excised uh, trabecular meshwork behind the instrument. Uh, if you have bleeding during the surgery, apply more viscoelastic, brush it out of the way. You'll also be raising the pressure and, and making the likelihood of reflux bleeding lower. Um, now, once you've gone through one pass, you're going to have a strip of trabecular meshwork. So what you now want to do is come from the other angle and make sure you're a little further along so that you'll excise, you'll pierce the trabecular meshwork into the canal again, 
sweep across and then remove that final strip of trabecular meshwork. You don't always uh, get the strip. Um, you know, it's not always like the video I showed where you can hold it in your hands after. If you see the strip dangling, say for example, you've done the surgery and now you're doing INA and you see the strip dangling, uh, you'd like to make an effort to get it out. Um, irrigation aspiration does not do a good job of removing that strip if it's still firmly attached to the angle. So you could uh, take the Kahook dual blade and go back and sweep a little bit more. Uh, you could use micro forceps or micro scissors or something to cut it out. It's not going to be a visual problem for the patient if the strip is still in there. But mainly we want to get rid of it because we don't want it to heal back in. You know, conceptually the, this dual blade is invented to be different from just a goniotomy where you're making an incision that can heal. If you, if you remove the strip, uh, it can't heal. It's going to have to remain open and that's why we're hoping for long-term pressure reduction. Uh, so we, we talked about removing it from the chamber. Um, uh, blood reflux, as I said, can happen. Uh, you know, generally, um, my pearls with this are at the end of the case, if you're getting some reflux, just bring the pressure up. Uh, put a lot of BSS in the eye. Uh, leaving an eye with a pressure of 30 at the end of a cataract surgery uh, to prevent reflux bleeding, uh, first of all, the pressure is going to normalize very quickly. Um, and it, it can help get sort of better outcomes. If I'm worried because there's nerve damage, I'll use oral diamox at the end of the cataract surgery. If you leave this eye with a pressure of eight, though, below episcleral venous pressure, you can expect a hyphema just based on hemodynamics alone. Uh, and while that hyphema will likely clear, it's not really what we're looking for. Um, again, if it happens during the surgery, viscoelastic will remove any reflux blood. Uh, so again, the angle is important. Um, getting the, the dual blade sort of nested into the angle, and this is more, maybe a little bit of a feel thing, and this comes with experience, um, but you do want to make sure you push the heel into the angle, so you're not just engaging with the tip, you're not scratching the surface of the angle, you're nestling into the canal and then dragging across. talked about catching and engaging the back wall, which is something we want to try to avoid. Um, and then I just have one more video here of the uh, entire procedure. So, you know, viscoelastic on the surface of the eye. One of the things that starts coming into your mind when you're doing the surgery is, is viscoelastic management because you, know, you have your typical two vials you're using for a cataract surgery, but now um, you know, we're inflating the chamber an extra time, we're putting viscoelastic on the cornea. I tend to use, if I have any leftover viscoate or a dispersive viscoelastic, I'll use that on the cornea for visualization and then I'll use my cohesive inside the eye. Uh, this is, I think, the Vold Gonio lens. It has basically a Thornton ring on it as well, which can help you get a little bit better control over the eye if you need to move it or stabilize it. The warning here with the Vold Gonio lens is that you know, patients can feel a Thornton ring. So if they're not blocked, you're going to want to apply a little topical. Uh, so here we are uh, engaging uh, the angle with a dual blade. Uh, great question about anticoagulants, and, and then you remind me of another point I wanted to make. Um, you'd like to, uh, you, you would like to. Um, I think, uh, again, if you think about doing something more invasive like a trabeculectomy, say it's someone who can't have their anticoagulants stopped, um, this probably is still going to be a better option because, you know, the choroidal hemorrhage is the last thing we would want in that setting. But I think you can expect a little bit more bleeding in that case and you may have a little more trouble. I had one with an aspirin patient. It wasn't, uh, wasn't the, the, the Kahook dual blade, but it was an angle surgery where, you know, there was a lot of bleeding. You would probably not want to do the FACO after this. So maybe with the eye stent it doesn't matter so much because you've only got a very small opening. But here you're opening up a lot and if you do the FACO after, you're going to have bleeding during the FACO because there's a lot of negative pressure during FACO with a vacuum. So my advice here is get the patient pseudophagic and then do the procedure once you've got the lens in the bag. Or if they're phagic, just go ahead and um, 
do the procedure, but you probably would not want to FACO after this. All right, and then so the management after, and I think this is my last slide, is uh, managed like a cataract. You know, you're gonna probably do PRED and taper. Hyphema on day one is, uh, is not the end of the world, although in my cases I've not seen it, and, and don't ask me why. I'm sure it can happen, I've just, I've had good results. Very low pressures. You can probably expect lower pressures here than with other micro bypass procedures, or in other words, my clinical experience is with the eye stent, sometimes the first day or week the pressure really doesn't come down, and maybe later on it does. Uh, here, things have been very good right from the beginning. So and now we're going to uh, see more about that and uh, look at some clinical data. And uh, thank you very much.